I think that what it taught me are some some what I still and what I still consider some of the really like key elements of like what does it mean to be a good product manager today um analytical thinking and and rigor where it's like if you're going to make a decision you have to measure it right and it's like if you it, you shouldn't be doing it if you don't know what impact it's going to have and if you can't like categorically state the value of it you might be wrong and that's fine you might your hypothesis might be wrong but as long as you know that's better than, than not knowing Hi everyone, welcome to episode 116 of the Startup Playbook podcast. I'm your host Rohit Parkava and each week I interview successful founders and investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they used to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. I am delighted to have Meena Radhakrishnan, the co-founder of Different, as my guest for this episode. Meena started her career at Goldman Sachs and at Google before jumping into startups, initially at ModCloth and then at Uber as employee number 20 and the very first product manager. She is now the co-founder of Different, a full-service property management platform that since launching in 2017 is already managing over $1 billion worth of residential properties in Australia, has grown to over 50 staff and has recently closed a $7.1 million Series A round in funding. We covered a range of topics in this interview, including Mina's experience as Uber's first product manager, frameworks for decision-making, how to find and hire great product managers, how to build relationships with investors, and much more. Without further ado, here's my interview with Mina Radhakrishnan. Mina, welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to join us this morning. Thanks for having me, Rohit. So Mina, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Sounds good. Um, this is a long and winding path to Australia. Um, so um, I'll, uh, I, uh, I'm Canadian actually, grew up in Toronto, um, but went to the States for university and I've sort of been out in the States for quite a while. So my first, um, first job out of university was working at Goldman Sachs. Um, back when building BlackBerry apps was cutting edge technology. <laughs> so um, I really wanted to, you know, Goldman was an amazing place to be, but I, I really wanted to do something that was at a technology company because at the end of the day, um, technology is not what drives going forward. It's an investment bank. Um, and so I was trying to think about kind of what that was for me. And um, I had this sort of circuitous path where I kind of went to business school um, for about three weeks um, and then ended up dropping out of business school and moving to California to uh, to join Google. And I was in the Google um, APM program or associate product manager program, um, and, which is like a, a rotational product management program that Google runs. Um, I was there for about three years. I uh, got bitten by the startup bug and left to go join a company called ModCloth um, as one of their first product managers. Um, they just uh, raised an A round and they were kind of moving to California and rebuilding up the business. Learned a ton about e-commerce. Um, and so after about a year there, I kind of felt like I'd actually come full circle in my career where again, I was at a company working in a tech role, but it wasn't really technology that drove that company forward because I think with a fashion e-commerce business, um, Marketing and merchandising is really kind of the core, uh, the core driver of the company. Um, and so I, I really wanted to look for something new and I, I felt like startups were where I wanted to be. I love that feeling of working in a really small company, of driving and moving the company forward. Wanted to do something, um, you know, in mobile since it was the dawn of the mobile era, like it's still pretty early on. The iPhone's just been introduced. Um, you know, the app store has only recently come out and I felt like that was going to be something really powerful. Um, and so a friend introduced me to this guy named Travis and I joined this little company at the time called Uber, um, as their first product manager and Uber was about just under 20 people at the time. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about what happened there, but it was, you know, pretty, pretty wild four years. Um, and then, uh, I just left Uber and took some time off to just try and figure out what it was I wanted to do next. And I was in this place where I was like, look, I've, I've done the big company thing and that was fun, but I don't want to do that again. I've been the first product manager at a startup and grown it and built it out several times. And that was a lot of fun, but I don't want to do that again. Um, and it felt for me like there were kind of two paths. Like I, I knew I loved product. I love startups. I love tech. I knew that was what I wanted to. I, I found the place for me. Um, and it felt like I could either be a founder because I'd never done that before or go down the investor path um, because I'd also never done that before. And so I spent a year sort of playing at being an investor as an entrepreneur in residence at Redpoint. um, And then as also an investor at Cowboy to get a sense of both kind of like um, seed stage companies and also slightly later like A and B and growth. Um, And I really learned a lot from it because 
it's a very different feeling when you're an investor and you can't be actively involved in the operations of the company and you have to evaluate it and make this decision about, am I going to write these founders like a million dollar check? Um, and so I, I felt like I understood companies and got to see them from that new perspective. Um, but I really kind of at the end of that sort of year or so I was, was itching to sort of get back into things. And I felt like, hey, this is the right time for me to, to go found something. And my husband um, was in very much the same place at that time. Um, and, you know, his, 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 his journey and background is quite complementary to mine. Um, he made it through business school. I dropped out. But, um, and so, you know, we, we felt like given, given our respective skills that we would actually be really good at running a company together and so that's what we did we said hey let's go let's go build something um and we had just gotten married and so we um we decided actually to take some time off so we, we sold our houses in san francisco we packed our stuff in a bag put the rest in storage and um and then went traveling around the world and that was um like with the idea being that at the end of that time we would have figured out what we wanted to do and where we wanted to do it. Um, and he's Australian. Um, so we weren't, neither of us, we, while we lived in the States for a long time, neither of us were necessarily like, we have to live in the States, this is where we need to be. We were kind of open to trying new things and just figuring out where we wanted to go and really could have been anywhere. Um, and so we, we had this throughout the sort of like, you know, throughout this, this trip, we, we have this um, Google Doc which we sometimes go back and refer to as like list of startup ideas. And most of them, I kid you not, are absolutely awful. Like nobody should work on those things. But I think this is the key around like building a startup is you, you actually have to start with quantity before you can get to quality. Um, and when we hit upon different, um, which, you know, came about uh, through like coincidentally, just like with my father-in-law and sort of like chatting with him um, and the problems that he was having in this space, um, it felt like, hey, this is the one. Like, this is something that we think we can really build and create something um, of value. And Australia felt like a great starting market to do it in um, for a lot of reasons and the way that the market is shaped and set up for this particular industry and type of company. Um, and so that's what we did. We moved to Sydney um, in 2017, beginning of 2017. And, um, and yeah, just uh, started working on different. And that's where, that's where we are now. Uh, obviously, an, an incredible journey, and uh, I think you kind of touched on something that you know. I think every start startup founder has a book or a, a Google Doc with with full of terrible ideas um, that they've come up with over a period of time. But Mina, um, obviously, well, you know, you touched on some of your experience with Uber and ModCloth and um, and different, which we'll obviously get into. But something that you touched on was uh, the three weeks that you spent at, at business school and doing my uh, research for this interview. Uh, I think in one of the, the previous interviews that you mentioned a few years ago, that was one of the most important decisions that you made uh, at that time of, of deciding that actually it wasn't the right thing for you and, and potentially there was another path. Do you want to share a little bit about what that, um, what that kind of decision making process was like for you at that moment in time in, in sort of realizing that potentially uh, business school or, or that particular sort of format wasn't the right thing for you at that time? Yeah, and um, I'd actually like I I knew I wanted I didn't want to stay at Goldman anymore. I felt like it wasn't the right place for me, and I was trying to decide what I wanted to do next. So I, it's funny because I actually never even applied to Google. Somebody had submitted my resume, and Google randomly reached out to me, and um, and so I've been interviewing with them actually for quite a long time. And I just and I I've already been applying to business school and doing everything else sort of in parallel. And I had made it all the way through these final rounds. Actually, I interviewed with Marissa. Um, and I was waiting for a, for a decision back. I and mean, it's sort of been like, you know, three weeks at this point. I was like, well, I'm, I'm not gonna sit around and wait for a decision here. I just, I need to like make a call and, and move on. And so I, so I, I gave him, I gave him my notice at Goldman and then um, went and then like, you know, packed my bags and moved to, moved to Michigan to go to business school. And, and the thing is like, I, 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 this Google thing was just sitting there in the background. I was like, well, I, I mean, it'll come through or it won't. There's not much I can do about it. So I'm just, I'm gonna move forward and see what happens. And I literally, like, you know, it was, went to orientation and met all my classmates, did all this stuff, like, you know, signed up for my class. Hadn't purchased any textbooks yet because I was like, well, that feels like a little bit irreversible. So let me, let me wait on that one. And three days before classes started, um, I got a call on, like, like it was Friday, I got a call up from, from my Google recruiter saying, hey, congratulations, we're making you an offer. It's in the mail, you'll get the FedEx tomorrow. And, um, and so I got the FedEx on Saturday morning and I, I really, I did spend all weekend thinking about it. It was kind of like, well, you know, I've got two great options here in front of me, right? Like that, this, I feel very lucky to have these, these two choices. But for me, the biggest thing was just that it's like, look, I can go to school and wait to get this job, or I can just do this thing right now, which is what I want to do, you know? And, and that, that was really what it came down to at that point. It was just like an easy decision where it's like, yeah, I could. And I'm sure that this will be very, I'm sure that an MBA will be incredibly useful for many other things, but actually, I just want to do this thing right now. So why wait? 
And, um, and yeah, and, and when you put it that way, for me, that, that was an easy decision at that point. So I walked into the dean's office on Monday morning and um, yeah, dropped out of school. <laughs> I never even made it to class, so I don't know if that fully really counts. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, know if the, I don't know if that helps in the decision making process or not. But uh, one of the things that uh, I think, again, you, you sort of mentioned about your time at Google was, uh, I think you joined as the AP, um, joined as part of the APM program, the mm -hmm. Associate uh, Product, uh, Product Management Program. And so, you know, obviously, product management isn't necessarily something that you, go to, you can go to university to and get a degree in. Um, but it really is, is a discipline as well. What were sort of some of the uh, what was that? What did that program entail, and what was sort of some of the fundamentals that you sort of learnt uh, during that during that time at Google um, that you were able to apply for the apply to the different startups that you were both working with and, and to different as well? Yeah, I think the APM program is just it's an incredible incredible group of people, and I think two things. one is like it's an amazing network. Um, you get so much value out of just the people that you're that you're with, and I it's not just about what you do. I think it's the the collective surroundings of this incredible like smart talented group of people um and like basically it was created because google as you say you couldn't find product managers there's no like any today like i actually don't think there is such a thing as a university degree for product management it's kind of the skill of experience and, and how you think to some extent and you can get that in so many different ways um and like it's a it's a rotational product management program with like basic like you get fundamentally trained in the skills of what does it mean to be a good product manager at Google and how do we think about product management and what does that relate to? So you get to explore kind of like a wide variety of different roles as well. Um, there's a ton of executive uh, leadership and coaching, which is really nice because um, it's, it's such a great way to get um, to, to get very direct mentorship and um, and work experience with like just amazingly talented people. Um, there's so much of, of this program too that is like, you know, I remember like, presenting directly to like Larry and Sergey or like Google product reviews like three months into my job. And like, that's pretty amazing. You know, you, it's not very many places where you get to do those kinds of things. So um, I think that what it taught me are some, some what I still, and what I still consider some of the really like key elements of like, what does it mean to be a good product manager today? Um, analytical thinking and, and rigor, where it's like, if you're gonna make a decision, you have to measure it. Right. And it's like if you it, you shouldn't be doing it if you don't know what impact it's going to have and if you can't like categorically state the value of it. You might be wrong and that's fine. You might your hypothesis might be wrong, but as long as you know that's better than, than not knowing. Um, I think communication um, in so many different ways, like not just um, not just speaking with people, but like written communication, how you pull that together. Like I just I think to be a good PM, you need to be a good writer. Um, and that's a really critical, critical element of this. And then um, also like launching like what does it mean it's one thing to build a product it's another thing to launch a product right and like at google like when you're launching a product it's not just for a few people it's like i mean at one point like i was a pm on google toolbar when you know this is taking back in time but like this is the time when like you know internet explorer was the primary and dominant browser on the market and if if you weren't search on Internet Explorer, you weren't going to be able to be successful. And, and obviously, like Google relies on search, right? So Google Toolbar was used by like a third of the worldwide internet population, basically. Wow. So you launch a product on Google Toolbar, it's like not only got to be in like 40 languages, but like the, the scale of it is just incredible. And so thinking about like planning and coordinating a really complex launch um, is just like, there's not very many places in the world where you get to do things like that. Yeah, and obviously, you know, some of your experience at, at Uber as well, um, there wouldn't be many companies that have been able to kind of grow and scale uh, at that particular size as well. And you sort of touch on uh, touch on something a little bit earlier where, you know, you, you've had uh, you had multiple options in front of you. And I'm sure that when you decided to leave Mudcloth as well, um, you know, there were potentially a range of different options that, that you could have taken uh, in front of you at that time. You know, in hindsight, uh, joining Uber when they had 20 staff, um, seems like a really obvious decision now, but I imagine it was very different, uh, a very different situation back then with a team of uh, a team of less than twenty at that time. What was that initial meeting like with with Travis, or what was it specifically about Uber at that time that made you feel like it was the the right opportunity for you? Yeah, it's, it's twenty, right? It's like a very like sliding doors kind of thing. Like you know, if you've gone on this path or gone down the other path, so like. When I left my club, I was pretty directed about my search, right? And I made a list of like, hey, here, I, I looked at like a lot of VCs that I respected and made a list of like, and, and knew that I wanted to be early stage. So I made this list of companies that in that 
speech from those VPs and like basically just went through and was like, okay, who do I know at all of these companies or know somebody who knows someone at these companies? And, and I think this is this is the power of the APM network. It's incredible um, that there are so many people who, um, who who were who I who I knew who actually knew people at those companies and um, and it came I, I interviewed with a bunch of different places and it, it actually came down to two companies um, and there's a company called Inkling and then there there's Uber of course um, and I actually had been leaning towards Inkling um, so there may be like fifty people there's like digital publishing of textbooks and you know e textbooks and it, it was just like running their their mobile um, Android program. And it was really, it just sounded really cool. And I love the space. And I thought, hey, this is this is a way to really change things, you know? Um, and what happened is, and it's it's just, it's just so random. Like what happened is that I was in like basically the final stages with Uber and, and it was going, you know, quickly and really well. And I was in the final stages with Inkling. And they really wanted me to meet the CEO. The CEO was out of town and like didn't want to do a video interview and wasn't going to be back for another week or so. And I was like, well, I'm not really going to wait for this. Like, I, I need to make a decision now. Um, and so, yeah, I just was like, all right, cool. Let's let's go to Uber. Like, that seems really great. Like, and, and Travis is an incredibly charismatic person and the story he was telling. And just the people that I met. Like, I just had a lot of fun actually with the interview. Like, it was. We, we get in a room, we have a white, like the final thing is a whiteboard challenge, let's solve this problem, how are we gonna work on it, what are we gonna do together? And I was like, this just was really enjoyable. Like that feels like the kind of thing that I'd like to do every day. Um, and that was pretty much what happened with Uber. And in Inkling, by the way, um, didn't really go anywhere, which is probably why most people haven't heard of it. Um, you know, it's a it, tough, tough market, tough industry. And um, ultimately, I think the company either shut down or got sold um, to somebody. Good, good decision in the end for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, it's funny because like my, you know, my parents are like, okay, they, they didn't so much like business school was a, it, it was an interesting one because I think it's not like I was leaving business school to go do nothing. I was leaving business school to go to Google. So it wasn't like that. They were like, okay, well, fine. That's all right. Um, but then I left Google and I went to this like random small startup and they're like, what is this random small startup? And then they just gotten used to that. And I was like, I'm leaving this small startup. We go to another random small startup. I don't know about this black car company. Like what is it they do? And you know, hindsight, obviously it's like, yeah, that was, that was a good decision. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've mentioned this a few times on the podcast as well. Um, telling my parents that I was leaving my engineering job to start a fashion tech startup is a very interesting conversation to have with Indian parents as, as well. <laughs> um, so I totally, I totally resonate with, with your experience with that. Um, Mina, you, you obviously kind of spoke about, uh, you know, we just kind of spoke about making decisions and sometimes, um, you know, particular decisions, decisions get made for us. But I imagine specifically as a product manager, you're obviously having to balance a range of different sort of feature requests from both customers as well as internal requests. How do you, um, how do you decide what you say no to? I, th I think one of your uh, quotes from a previous session that you ran was uh, to launch uh, some things, you have to say no to other things. Um, and so, you know, what is it, are there particular frameworks that you use to help you decide what particular features or products or, or those sorts of things that you want to focus on and what you end up saying no to in the end? Yeah, I mean, and it's really tough because so much of product is unfortunately about saying no and you have to find the right, A, you have to find the right way to do it and you have to be principled about it because you don't want to kill ideas, you don't want to kill creativity, you want people to feel like, Oh, I get it. Okay, this is what I'm doing. So I think there's a couple of things that that come into that. So for me, one thing that's really important is um, like I think with with um, product management, it's developing a uh, developing a roadmap, right? And so I have a pretty like kind of strict framework now for developing roadmaps that like I've just kind of created for myself over the course of the over the course of sort of my experience. Um, and basically, everybody on my team at different uses this format now as well. And I, and I think it's really helpful. So there's a couple of key things. One is that um, I think. First, as a founder and as a leader, you have to provide good strategy and metrics in terms of where people can look from. Like you have to provide clear direction of this is what we are looking to do as a company. Here are the two or three, and no more than two or three metrics that matter the most, and here's why they matter, and here's a bunch of initiatives that we think are important, um, which are very vague and broad, like there's pillars really more than anything else. So I think that's, first of all, a very critical thing that as a company, you have to be clear about what your direction is, because otherwise nobody can execute on that and move towards it. So um, if you find as a as a product person that your leadership at the company, you don't feel like you know what the goal of the company is and where it's trying to go, that I think is the first thing that you need to go figure out. It's like, well, 
what what am I trying to change? Is it that is it is growth the most important thing? Is unit economics the most important thing? Like what what are we looking to do? And obviously, like people will say, well, both, you know, like, okay, but which one? Like where where am I going to make where am I going to make better? So that I think is the first thing is having having a top down view of like what is what is the goal of where we're trying to go as a company. Then I think as a from a product's perspective, the way that I always like to work through roadmaps is roadmaps are I think more of an art and a science. Um, and one thing that I think is really important with roadmaps is they're they're not they're not um, a timeline of features. Um, I just I just don't believe that you can not at a startup anyway that you can create a timeline of features and say this is it and this is how it's going to work. It's it's actually an illustrative list of problems, right? And it, you might have an idea about what a solution could be, but it's not some like defined set of things. So where I like to start with is first. Um, defining a framework for a roadmap and a framework is basically anywhere between three and five metrics where you say hey these are the these are the things that I think are really important so it might be um, you know it reduces the time for this particular thing it might be strategic importance it might be um, compliance impact it might be something else so you sort of have those these five things and then you define a very quantitative way to be able to approach that. So for example, if it's a time thing, um, you say, hey, this if a, a solution that's considered like, you know, uh, like it's essentially a high, medium, low sort of thing, um, like if it's if it's high in 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 time solutions, then that means it saves days. If it's a medium, it saves um, minutes, and if it's low, it saves seconds. So it's, you know, you can kind of do it that way. Um, Similarly, like if it's compliance, like again, you have very, it's like if it's tiny, you low, you have to be very specific about what those are. And you define those sort of those, those five, um, like area, three to five areas, you define kind of the, the quantitative impact of them. And then you usually have this long list of ideas that you come up with, right? And that you've, that you've developed through like your own experience, you're talking with stakeholders, you're talking with customers, a bunch of things, and you put them together and then you rank all those ideas against the actual kind of set of framework and metrics. And, and then, you know, and, and there's different, depending on how you do it as well, there's, there's weighting, right? So it might be a strategic importance, might be 20%, but um, time time solving may, may be like you know 80 percent whatever it happens to be and you and then you can take that and because you create this very quantitative way of defining it you can score it and so you take all of the ideas and you score them and there's basically like there's a there's a some number at which you like have to kind of cut it off right and it's not a again it's it's a, it's not it's an art not a science and what what is that exact number what's the cutoff you, it depends a little bit on the size of your engineering team and how much you can realistically take on, but in a given quarter, I, you know, it's somewhere, I, I find generally that it's somewhere between sort of 10 and 15 things if you define your, your roadmap sort of in a, in, a, in a relatively vague way where you don't have like defined solutions. And then you take that and then you apply what I call a rationality filter, where it's like, all right, cool, I, I scored it in this way, but is there something in my scoring that I missed that I didn't quite understand, you know? And it's like, hey, you know what, this one could have a big impact, but actually, we have like a, a backup solution for this, which can be done manually. So maybe this isn't the most critical thing. We could do this instead. Um, and so it's thinking about it in that way. You apply the rationality filter. You've done the scoring, and now like what you have is actually okay. Cool. So here is this kind of roadmap of sort of set of things that you have. And so when somebody comes to you, like in the process, and now it's the quarter. Now the quarter has started. You're in the middle of like implementing this roadmap, and somebody comes to you and says, "Hey, can we do this thing instead?" It's like, hmm. Let's think about that. Does that thing fit into one of these areas that we define like from the perspective of the roadmap? Yes, it does. Okay, cool. So it, we're gonna we're planning to do something along those lines here. Let's talk a little bit about your ideas about because typically people aren't coming to you with problems, they're coming to you with solutions, right? And so you want to sort of like take it and understand what is their problem, what are they trying to do, and make sure that you've understood that and, and know where it goes comes into. Um and so if it, if it's in if it's down that path, then it generally works pretty well because then people are like, okay, cool. So you're gonna be working on that in a couple of months, that sounds great. Or you're in the middle of it right now. The, the challenge comes when somebody comes to you and says, hey, can we, can we do this awesome thing? I've got a great idea. And it often is a great idea. It's not that it isn't, but it isn't in the list of things that we have prioritized and set. So you're like, oh, that's an interesting one. If it's in the list of things that you took off the cutoff, great. Well, then you can have that discussion and say, hey, this one came in here. Let me, let me show you a little bit about how this, how this came into play. And let's talk about why we deprioritized it. And again, you're, you're pulling from a very rational place. You're saying, first of all, let's see, do you agree with these things, right? These are the sort of three to five things that I think are the most important, and here's why. And generally, like people, you know, if you build the right ones, people get on the same page about that. And if they don't, well, then you can have that discussion and you can explain why and see how it relates back to the company. And, and you can usually come to a pretty amicable thing around like, okay, yeah, I agree. That's where, that's where these metrics are and they, that's how they make sense. And then you explain kind of, well, okay, as a result of that, here's why it came down like 29th on the list. So that's why we're not doing it. And they're like, oh, okay, 
got it, that makes sense, I get it. And then the way that you can turn that around is say, but here's some ideas of what you could do. Here's a low code solution, here's a no code solution. Here is a different product that can accomplish some of those things, maybe not all of those things. And that I think is really the, the art of actually building stuff is that you, you have to have, you have to have confidence in your approach. Um, you have to have confidence in the framework that you've built because you believe that it relates back to the company ultimately. Um, and then when you approach it from that perspective, you, you can you can work with people in a very rational format. And I think that that's the key thing around product. Yeah, it's it's exceptionally hard, especially when you're uh, at a you know at, at scale and you've got a large internal teams, or you know you're working with teams in different cities or or um, different countries, and uh, you know there are a bunch of feature requests that are coming in that might be extremely sort of localized and might be really important to them, but might not sort of fit into the product um, product roadmap that you have for that particular quarter. And so uh, balancing those kind of requirements that might be sort of priorities to other people, but may not necessarily be priorities for you, and just but having clarity in in that way of having those type of conversations or being able to demonstrate why something is or isn't a priority is really important. Yeah. Process. Um, you know, one of the things that you obviously touched on, Mina, was uh, was kind of the importance of metrics there to be able to um, to help you delineate what is and what isn't important at a particular moment in time. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I guess Uber was really known for was doing really creative things like um, having a mariachi band on demand or kittens on demand uh, and those sort of things as well. And uh, you know, I, I assume that part of that was to really help get people to become familiar with not just ordering um, a you know, a black car service, uh, but really being able to get them familiarized with the product and being able to think about what other things they could do. When you're launching, um, I guess, creative products or, or running campaigns like that, what are some metrics that you, uh, that you use or how do you assess whether something is actually working in the way that you want it to or, um, or you need to sort of revisit that and, and find a different way? Yeah, and you know, the, while some of those things were like, hey, this is a fun idea, it's like a bit of a marketing gimmick, um, you're right, and in that, like, I think a big part of it was trying to figure out, hey, how do we build this flexible system where you could get anything on demand? What would that mean? How would it work? How would you be able to access it in the app? What would it look like? So that was definitely, there was a core, like, strategic question that we wanted to figure out, which is, like, what's the right way to do this? Because we knew that, like, you know, as a company, like, that was something that was critical for, even if it was just about ordering multiple types of cars, like, that's a different thing, too, you know? So that, that was, like, a really key one. I think some ways, I mean, I, I certainly wasn't thinking about Uber Eats necessarily at the time, but it was definitely some of the harbinger of, of that, right? Um, and I think there's a couple, like, you, you do have to measure, but I think the key is, like, you have to be clear about what what is the what is the outcome like what is the thing that you actually what's the question you want to answer like does it work at all do people use it okay well if people use it how many people use it and things like especially when it comes to stuff like you know in some ways like uber is like global commerce right like you've got to, you look at look at there's very basic things you're looking at like revenue <laughs> like you know, a, a ability to deliver, like how many, how many were fulfilled, how many were unfulfilled, how many canceled, what was the average order value, like what's the sum total of those things, and, and I think like regardless of the, of the company, the business, the industry, it's some pretty just simple basic things that everyone's always looking for, the key and the, the hard part is trying to figure out like, okay, well which of those things am I looking at, and so that's the question you really have, it's like, am I testing, does this work? Or am I testing how well does this work? And that's often a starting point around it because if it works at all, like, okay, well, I may not have got it right initially, but here are some other things I can do the next time I do this so that I can test this part further. But I think that's, it's a, it's a branching thing where the first one is like, does it work or how well does it work? Which, where are you trying to accomplish? If it's how well does it work, then it becomes a lot clearer. Okay, so here are the key things that I want to understand. These are the levers I want to pull. Um, and you, again, want to be focused, I think, right? Like it's hard to evaluate like, seven things at once you have to think okay i want to test how well it works and i want to test how well it works in terms of size of like you know average order value and that's the thing that i'm going to go focus on and, and then you can start to build and, and develop the product from there you know it's, it's exceptionally hard when you're an early stage founder to to really um to, to really balance everything that you need to do um, in terms of your product development and product roadmap with, uh, you know, trying to grow your business and, and make sure that you're being sustainable. And especially if you sort of look at, um, you know, companies or products that are selling to enterprise, there are often, you know, potential large, um, large prospects or large customers that have a, a range of different feature requests for you that may or may not fit in with your specific product vision or product roadmap. How do you find that balance or kind of what are your recommendations for, for founders who are potentially in that situation where uh, 
you know, having to, to build out these particular feature requests will take a large amount of dev resources, um, but they're, you know, potentially important um, clients to, to bring on board. How do you balance between kind of the short-term need um, and requirements with kind of the long-term product vision and, and roadmap? Yeah, that's a that's a tough one, and um, and I experienced some of this when I was working on the um, in in ads at Google. Um, it's it's always tough when you've got a sales team and you have to sort of figure out the right way to to interpret that, right? I, I think there are two key things that come into play. One is I think especially if you're going to be in like enterprise SaaS, right? It is very important to work well with your sales team, but it's also very important to have a direct connection to customers because it comes back down to like the 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 the, the, the sales team is going to tell you, hey, the customer asked for this, right? And sometimes like that is exactly what the customer asked for. But actually, what you want to know is what's the problem they're trying to solve, right? And the question is, is the problem they're trying to solve something that you believe is part of what your overall product should do? And if it is, well, then it becomes a much simpler kind of conversation to have around, okay, when are we going to do it? Is it right important? Is it hard to come in by the way? Um, and But I also think that this is why I think it's so important to have like strong leadership be able to talk about it because sometimes the problem they're trying to solve has nothing to do with what you as a company are trying to accomplish. And to have the conviction and ability to say no to some of those things, because you do, you have to just say like, that's actually not what we're trying to do. And if that's what you want this product to solve, like you're probably using the wrong product, here's something else that, that you need to think about. So I think that those are like, it's, and you know, you've got to get down is like the actual it's, it's these are these are like I'm giving very general broad statements here right but like you, as you dig down to a specific problem but I, I think these are two really important things when it comes to dealing with sales and enterprise SaaS especially is that you have to you have to also know the customer like it's not enough to just take feedback in from a sales team if you're not going directly to the source you don't understand the problems and secondly like you just have to be really sure about what your product is out to do and where I think it's really quite helpful is if you've got like, you know, obviously if you've got like five different people coming in and telling you, hey, the customer asked for this and this and this, and you can find like a common nugget or a kernel underneath that where it's like, ah, actually they're all trying to solve the same problem of it's really hard to search for duplicates or whatever it happens to be. Then you can really think about that and say like, we missed this. Why did we miss this? Why isn't it on our roadmap? Let's come back to the roadmap and see like, ah, this is where it is. We actually factored it in, but decided that this was more important. And maybe you were wrong. And if you're wrong, that's okay. That's it's all right to, to to change the roadmap. But you don't want to do it too often. You do want to ask yourself, hmm, I'm changing the roadmap. What where is it that I missed it, right? Because something was off, right? In your in the way that you in your weighting of like whatever factors you used or um, how you decided to do it. Or if it wasn't on your roadmap at all, then you really missed something because it's like, hmm, didn't forgot to talk to that person. Like now I know that next time around I'm gonna make sure I get that feedback and bring this into it. So I, I think these are some of the things you can you can use to kind of work with that. Yeah. And obviously, you know, something you've kind of touched on throughout this interview is that, you know, obviously the product management role itself is just so multidisciplinary, like you need so many different skill sets and, and experiences that, uh, you know, often product managers come from a range of different backgrounds as well. Um, from your experience, what are the things that separate uh, a really good product manager from a great product manager? And specifically, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Different is looking for a product for the first product manager as well at the moment. So what are the specific kind of characteristics or the prototype um, in the type of person that you're looking for to, to join your company? Yeah. Um, so we actually just hired one product manager, but I am looking for one more. Congratulations. <laughs> um, and, um, and so like, what do I, what do I look for? I, well, I think... Um, as I said, I think anal analytical thinking and just that the rigor of that is really important because the question you have to consistently be able to answer well in product is why. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this now? Like, what is the value of it? That That is such a critical thing. And, and if somebody isn't like, I often find myself talking to myself like, because like I need to argue it out with myself to be like, but this is important. And what is this? And so playing that, that ability to play devil's advocate and go through that, I think is a really, is a really critical one. Um, another one of this, as I spoke about before, is the communication side of things. Um, and then the, the I think with, when it comes to, by the way, just one other note on the analytical side is that, I think you're really good with data. Like it doesn't necessarily, uh, for, for, you know, I, I think that the, the best PMs are ones who can like dig into like, you know, write, write, like write Mongo queries or write SQL queries and actually just be able to like look at the data and really understand what it is again to ask the question, like, why are we doing this specific thing? Why does it matter? Um, I think another really important one that we haven't talked about yet is just like the importance of 
being technical. And that doesn't necessarily mean, like, I think if you'd asked me this question maybe five years ago, I would have been like, oh, you've got to have a CS degree. If you don't have a computer science degree, like, you're not going to be a good PF. And I don't think that's true anymore. Um, and a lot of that is starting from Google, right, which has, like, very, like, you have to be a strong engineering kind of PM because you work very closely with engineering in that role. Um, and, I, and I don't, while obviously all PMs have to work very closely with engineering, I don't necessarily think you have to have a CS degree, but I do think you need to be able to understand the tech stack. You need to be able to have good conversations with engineers about trade-offs. If we do it this way, what does it mean? If we do it this way, what does it mean? What if we try doing it this way? Like, and, and really, like, you're not the one making the architectural decisions, and I, I don't think you should be, but you have to be able to understand why certain architectural decisions were made and make sure that they understand, like, hey, we are, we're doing this today, but the future is this. So make sure that when, you, when you're thinking about how you want to build it, that you accommodate for that. Because if you then have to rebuild the entire architecture, to solve for this future problem because you didn't think about it early on or because you didn't do a good job of letting the engineers know like, hey, this is where we're going to go with it. Well, that's on you, you know, like basically what you've done is like cause people to rebuild an entire architectural stack because you didn't think about the impact and the effect that it could have. And so I, I think that's like a really, a really key thing that, that comes into play. Like, you know, and as an example of this, like I think about, um, like I think about at Uber, right? Like how we had to rebuild everything to make it work for international. Um, and, but like knowing like, hey, this is what, this is the goal, this, this is the future, this is where we wanna go with international, um, allowed us to essentially like, a lot of work, a lot of effort, but when we rebuilt it, we knew where we were going and we were able to really kind of like build and develop on that. Same thing with like build, rebuilding car types, right? We're like, hey, we, don't, we, only, we only know of these two or three car types now, but in the future, what is the world in which we think about when there's maybe 17 different things that we could get? How might that go? How would we play into that? And you have to be able to have that discussion conversation around how it fits together. Um, so yeah, I think, I think those are the key things. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that often comes up from this podcast and, and interviewing um, founders and, and CEOs of, of companies is, you know, the challenge really becomes at, at a certain point, how do you find the right people as well? And how do you, you know, you might know the characteristics, but how do you make sure that you are really getting the right people um, into your company? Because they are really the ones that, that sort of drive the, the product vision and, and the roadmap and, and turn that into reality. What are yeah. some of the, you know, do you mind sharing what does that sort of process look like? Or, or how do you test for those characteristics through a hiring process? different yeah yeah and, it, and I think like you know it's hard, you've got to develop a good hiring process it's not an easy thing um what I find works for me is like we and we do this across sort of all of our roles are different and I think it works quite well which is like it's a three-stage process um so the first one is typically an interview with like a interview with like a founder or somebody senior at the company it's like a cultural fit sort of thing um and then it's like do, do I like you do you like me because like that's a really critical thing like you have to work with people that you both like and respect um, a second, then the second part of the interviews or second phase of it is that it's typically like a team style interview. So like you've got, you need somewhere between, depending on the, on the, um, on the seniority of the role, somewhere between four and eight people at the company where it's like, it's pretty quick. It's like 30 to 40 minute kind of things with each person and each person has a slightly different area that they focus on. One person might be the, like, I'm, I'm the, I'm going to be the analytical person. I'm going to be the, um, the, like, you know, the, um, the communication person, I'm going to be an industry person, I'm going to be the experience, whatever it happens to be. Um, and then based on that, what we do is we do a debrief um, with, um, with the team people that's met. And if you're like, everybody has to make a choice, either it's like strong yes, strong no, weak yes, weak no. And you can't be in the middle, right? Like you have to decide, like, do I like this person or do I not like this person? So the answer is, if it's not a yes, it's a no. Like that's what it always comes down to. There's no like, oh, I don't know how I feel. If you don't know how you feel, like it's a no. Um, and so um, the, the, the overall sort of feedback on it is generally that we want to, it's not like a, it must be unanimous, strong yes. Um, it's that like, it has to be pretty like consistently all yes. Like basically the question we ask is like, are you going to waste my time for the next 90 minutes to continue with this person? Yes or no. That, that's really the thing because then the final round is essentially like it's a 90 minute kind of whiteboard challenge interview um, where it's like what we do is we give people a question with three or four days in advance 
Um, and, the, and the way that we frame it is like, we want you to think about this question. We're not, you, know, you, know, you shouldn't be doing like tons and tons of work coming to us with a fully featured proposal. That's not the goal. We're not trying to get free work out of you. Um, what we want you to do is marinate on this problem and be the facilitator of like actually coming in and we're working on this thing together and we're going to try and solve it. Now, typically like we, we try to pick something that we're not like deeply in so that otherwise I think you're setting somebody up to fail, you know, where it's like, you know all about it. You've done all the work, you've done everything. It, it tends to be a much more vague, like, hey, down the line, like some, some point in the future, we should think about this. And, and while we have the industry experience, the context of the company and stuff, it's much more about like, how does this person work? Do we, do we generate ideas? Do we work well with each other? How do we get there? And I think it's that, that, that the, the three different kind of styles of those, of those phases um, generally help us get to a place where we're like, yep, pretty sure that like all of these things um, test the different areas that we're looking to understand. You know, one of the things that you mentioned right at the start of the interview was that, uh, you know, the, the story behind Different was that you and your, your husband traveled around for a year and uh, sort of decided that you wanted to, to start a company. And I think, uh, you know, one of the, if you, if you listen to, uh, if you watch TV shows or watch movies, as you know, they often kind of frame everything around this single moment in time where, you know, everything kind of falls into place. Um, but oftentimes, like, you know, from my experience, a lot of it is you kind of start with a thread of a, a problem and you kind of dig in and, and it kind of evolves over time. Um, what did that sort of process look like for you over that, over the course of the year or kind of what was that sort of initial problem statement for, for different and how has that sort of evolved over time or, or what did that sort of process look like until you sort of got to, got to launch? Yeah, and I, I mean, you're right, like TVs and movies, you know, it's like a 30 minutes or 90 minutes to wrap everything up. It's got to like have an aha, eureka moment. Um, and, and we did have a little bit of that in that like, hey, I think this this one might actually work. Um, and like, we, you know, we sort of, I think it was like September or something. And we just like, we had come up with this thing where it's like, hey, it's, it's really bad. Like, let's actually think about what it, what it involves. How does it play out? You know, we laid out a bunch of wireframes and just started playing with things, a lot of it hotel stationery, like, you know, like, hey, what if it looked like this? How might it go through? Um, and so that was sort of like September. And I think like December is when we we really kind of like crystallized it. And we're like, yeah, I think this is the, this is the thing that we can do. We can focus on kind of this industry and where we want to work. Um, and then through the course of January, we actually ended up interviewing a ton of owners, tenants, and property managers to um, to kind of like figure out like, oh, what works, what doesn't work. And, you know, just sort of really, I think not, not necessarily having something, being very open-minded about like what people are saying, why they were saying it, and then just sort of going back and reviewing those notes to try and figure out like what was, what was going on with it. Um, and then we sort of really actively started working on, on building things in, in kind of February. So it was sort of like a, you know, five-ish months before we, we really kind of started digging in and creating and building it. And, I, you know, obviously I know from a founder perspective, everyone sort of likes hearing about what does, what does the sort of fundraising process look like uh, as well. And I know that you uh, recently closed a $7.1 million Series A round, but you'd closed a, uh, an early round of capital. I think it was $1.3 million uh, from memory. Yeah. Um, yeah, like that. yeah um, I guess, again, from, um, from, uh, from found perspective, what did that look like in terms of when did you first start having those conversations with, with investors? What did that process look like in um, sort of getting that, that first round of capital? Yeah, I, I think one thing that's really important with fundraising is that um, you are, the, the first conversation you have with somebody should not be like, hey, can you write me a check? Um, and so I, I really believe that the best way to, to do that is to build relationships very early on, keep VCs aware of what you're doing, be, you know, very open and honest about it and just like quite frankly state like I, I don't want your money right now. Um, and so that, that, that's where like when, when we first even moved out here, like I but I ended up getting a ton of intros and connections to um, people in, 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 in BC and Australia from, from my friends from the US. And it was all really helpful because it was just like, I mean, I, I was just working on something. I, I wasn't even sure that we were gonna raise a seed round to be totally honest. Um, and so like I've been chatting with people for like, you know, probably months before we even had the conversation um, about it. And so I like when I met with, um, with Craig, who's um, at, at Airtree and is on our board as well, like I probably had like, three or four just coffees randomly with him before we even really kind of seriously started talking about the business. Um, and, and I think like one thing that was really helpful for us is that like we tried to be pretty, um, pretty strict on our process. Like it's fine if the answer is no. 
like that's not an issue, but like let's have an answer and kind of like let's move through it. Or are there questions that you need to answer? Or where does it go? And so I think using that format worked pretty well for us. And that we, you know, I think because both um, both Rune and I have a bit of experience like being on the investor side, like we're fairly good at being able to sort of like know upfront, okay, this is what investors are looking for. So let's make sure we answer these questions. And that's fine. Again, if the answer to those questions isn't an answer that they like, that's all right. But at least we know we've answered the question. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I think you just kind of touched on something where we've had quite a few investors on the show as well. And, you know, one of the commonalities is, you know, every investor wants to meet with founders early. And, you know, one of the common sayings is that, you know, investors invest in lines, not dots. Um, mm -hmm. And you mentioned that there was, you know, four, uh, four to five meetings that you had with um, with Airtree specifically before they um, before you asked them or, or before they sort of looked at this as an investment opportunity. What were the um, what were the dots or what were the data points that you were um, that you were presenting, and I guess what were you sort of looking for in return to ensure, from your perspective, that they were potentially the right investment partner for you as well? Yeah, I think like um, I think is, is it Brad Fell? I think Brad Fell's book was super helpful. I think called Venture Deals, um, and we we definitely like read through that. Um, and I always say like you know VC is it's like it's a bit of a marriage, right? Like it, there's definitely a, a long term partnership there, and and I think it it falls into working in some ways kind of how you hire people like do you like these people do you really want to sit down and work with them like do you want to have tough conversations with them do you want to have like do you want to be able to celebrate your wins with them um and i think that's the biggest thing and, and a second thing that i think we get a lot of value out of from our board and our investors is that um they're they think strategically that they um they're like because you know we're just dealing with, we're in the, you're in the weeds all day long, right? You're like dealing with like the lowest of the low problems sometimes. And you have to be able to, as a founder, be able to pull yourself back up and really kind of think high level as well. And, um, and that, I think that's one thing that our board does really well. It's like, hey, this is where we're trying to go. This is our like long-term focus and um, uh, where we're, we're trying to merge. Is, is this the right path? Is this the right thing that you're thinking about? How do we make sure that we're always thinking about that, that long-term view? And so I think it's like, VCs who, who do think strategically and, and like I think that I asked um, you know I, I asked our like all the investors that we talked to like the question was just like what would your portfolio company say about you and then I went and actually talked to their portfolio companies to see if those things agreed as well because you want people who are um, quite introspective and like know how they work with people and, and how that goes and so I, I think that that's an important thing to ask because it's not just about like I think sometimes definitely it can feel during the fundraising process like oh my god can I just get the check like I just I really need this right now like it feels especially as you're you know running low on cash and you're in the fundraising process um but you really just have to have to ask this question of like it's not it's a two-way thing it's like yes I want your money but do I want you like and do you want me like it's both of those things have to have to come into play yeah, I, I think the Airtree team are great. I've had quite a few of the, the Airtree investment team on the podcast before. I think Alicia McDonald, who's the investment principal, was on a few weeks ago. And one of the things that they consistently... Board observer as well. Yeah, one of, the, uh, one of the things that they consistently mention across the board is they want to be the first point of contact, whether something's good or something bad. They want to be the first call that founders make. And I think that's a, that's a really, um, you know, to your point, um, you know, I think it's really important for founders to have a, a real partner that they look at, not just from an investment perspective, but will support um, because there's a range of uh, ups and downs that, that come with running a company. Um, I mean, a final question for me before we shift gears to audience Q&A as well. Um, you know, you uh, kind of touched on this that you were sort of traveling for, for quite a while and you weren't necessarily wedded to, uh, to launching the company in San Francisco or living there. Um, what was it specifically around Australia that made you want to, um, want to move here and uh, start different in, in the Australian market? Yeah, well, after 17 years of winter, I was like, I'm never living in a place that has snow ever again. Um, so pretty much I like we chase summer around the world on our trip. Um, and so like, I, I mean, I, I know it seems a little bit silly, but honestly, like I need sunshine and good weather to be able to function well. I don't work well in snow. Um, so, <laughs> but, but more like more seriously, I think there's a couple of like key things with the Australian market and specifically the business that we were trying to create, right? Um, one is that if there's wide distribution of investment property ownership, so 10% of Australians own investment property. Um, you know, the vast majority of them prefer to use a professional property manager rather than doing it themselves. And it's a big market. It's not like, I think that with, it, it's tough to start a business in Australia and be purely Australian if you really want to create like a multi-billion dollar business, right? Like it's not, it's, 
it's just, it's, there's only so many people in the country. Like there's, that's just the reality of it. Um, but property, I think, is one of the industries where like you can build a massive business even within Australia. Like in fees alone, people pay over four billion dollars of fees to property managers. If you've been paying even a small portion of that, that is that is a big thing. And and then I think the last kind of stat that makes it particularly interesting in Australia is that um, of that group of people that own an investment property it's it's not like it's not crazy rich people it's not you know land barons or real estate moguls it's like ordinary people 75 percent of them own only one property 15 percent own two um and and they're leveraged it's not like you know they've got like millions of dollars sitting around to buy an investment property like and so they, they they need something that works well for them and they're just they're ordinary everyday people who want to create wealth through property and I, and I think that that's like a really good set of people to serve like you know, you don't, I don't, for me personally, that's, I don't necessarily want to build something that is like only accessible to the ultra rich. Like I want to build something that I think can really genuinely help most normal people. Um, and so I think like for, for those reasons, just Australia as a, as a, as a, as a market made a ton of sense to, to start with. Um, and then, you know, like our goal is definitely to expand. Um, we do want to go to other places. We've been thinking pretty seriously about the U.S. this year. Um, obviously, with COVID, that is not going to happen this year. Um, but we, we definitely plan to do that. And that's just something we'll have to figure out the right time for, just given, given what's been going on in the world today. Fantastic. Mina, uh, we're going to shift gears now um, and move over to audience Q&A. So for those of you that are tuning in live, um, just a quick reminder that uh, you can submit questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the first question that I am going to pick out is submitted from Anika Rani, who wants to know, what is the toughest product decision you've had to make during the early stages of Different? Yeah, um, I, think, I think a big one was... You know, when we started out, we very consciously decided not to build an owner app. Um, we only had a responsive website. And it's hard because like, you know, oh, you're a tech company and like you don't even have an app for your owners. Like, and it was, um, it was a tough thing because we wanted to, we, we wanted to be really sure before we, before we put it into it. It's like, what is the, there has to be value to an app. There has to be a reason to create it versus building stuff on a website, right? Because like it's much easier to build on web than it is in the sense that it's easier to build on web. What I mean by that is is that when you when you make a when you make a change, you can just release it and it's good to go. Whereas mobile development, you've got to have like a very unique skill set on the engineering side. And secondly, like you're always dealing with this like constant delay of like you know reviews in the app store and like days potentially before it could go live. So you have to be very thoughtful about like how you release stuff and how you build your apps to, to make that happen. Um, and for us, it was that like, we don't even know if people are going to buy this thing. Like, we don't even know if it's going to work, if this is the right thing to do. And we don't want to force people to download an app in order to sign up for our service, right? Because you don't need to. Um, and so I think that one was like a very like, okay, what, what are the key things that owners are going to do? How do we provide it? How do we make it work? How do we make it fit and all of that together? And so like very consciously, we're like, you know what? We're going to build a tenant app. We're not going to build an owner app to start with. And we, we did ultimately do build an owner app, but it wasn't until, we didn't release it until the beginning of this year. Uh, the next question was just a clarification on the book that you mentioned. So it was Venture Deals by Brad Feld? Yes, Venture Deals by Brad. I mean, I may be wrong about the name, but it's definitely something like that. And it's yeah. definitely by Brad Feld. Yeah, uh, I think we've had that recommended on the show a few times. I will add a link to, to that book as well in the show notes to this episode uh, once this episode goes uh, gets published on Thursday, um, which will be available at startupplaybook.co. Uh, the next question submitted is from Anoop Chaudhary, who wants to know, uh, Mina, can you please talk a little bit about how you reimagined the rental industry and converted into a completely new space using tech? What was the process you used to reimagine this? Ooh, uh, <laughs> that's a big one. Let me unpack that a bit. Um, I think I'll, I'll start with the, the why, why did we choose to go into property management? Why do we believe that can change? Why, why do we believe that we can change things, right? Like, so, um, you know, we call the company different because you can't spell it without rent. So that is like, I think for us, we, we have no intention of ever going into real estate sales. Um, and I fundamentally don't want to go down that path because I, I don't really believe that technology can improve the sales process you know in a truly meaningful way like i think there are definitely tech solutions that can facilitate it but i, I don't think that the sales process is fundamentally improved by technology on the other hand when i look at what property management is it's um it's it's doing things on a set schedule making sure that those tasks are done confirmed and followed up 
And I think that's exactly the kind of stuff that technology is really good at, right? Like people, we procrastinate, we forget, like that's not the stuff that we're great at. We're great at compassion, sympathy, empathy, negotiation, like that's the stuff that I think we need people for. And that's, I think that that's there in property management, but it's 20%. The 80% of it is just like, okay, got to remember to collect the rent, got to remember to follow up on statement, got to remember to like, you know, create this transaction, got to finish this maintenance request. Like it's very much like there's this constant task list and you just have to make sure that that task list is continuously taken care of and then people are aware of what's happening with it. Um, and so as I think about that, that for me was like, okay, well, this is the, um, th this is the key thing of what we're trying to create and that, that's why we, we can do it this way. Um, and then in terms of like, how do you build product? Like, well, that, that's a really uh, big question. I mean, I've answered some of that, I think on the roadmap. Um, and then the rest of it, I think like, as I mentioned before, I, th I think that it's like, you've got to know in the product development cycle, um, when to focus and when to flex. And I think you have always have to start with flex. Like it's a constant feeling of like, I'm going to flex and come up with a huge range of solutions. Then I'm going to focus. All right. Then I'm going to flex and come up with a bunch of different designs and, and, you know, focus again on the right one. And then you flex again when you're trying to think about like, okay, well, what are the different ways in which we could solve this problem? You keep kind of doing that process throughout the product development cycle. And so I think that that's sort of the key thing around how do you, how do you do it with technology? And, and the key is that you have to, you have to know when to be open and when to, when to again. Uh, the next question comes from Ravine Kuhadas, who wants to know, how do you align the sales team and product management team? Uh, for example, who resolves the potential conflict between them? Um, well, so we don't necessarily, I mean, we have a sales team, obviously, um, but the sales team, I think, is, the sales team is telling what the product management team is building right so in terms of like the conflict it's like where i think the conflict comes into play is like you know the sales team keeps saying hey we need this we need this we need this in order to be able to sell and the product management team says well we can't do that and that that i think is the conversation you need to have it's like why do you need it to be able to sell you know what what's the thing that your customers are saying that makes you feel like you need this specific thing and you, you dig into it and, and there's two things that happen with it either it's that like the problem that they're giving you is somewhat different and actually it can be sold in this way here's how you explain it here's how you talk about it here's how you build it and that that's a great conversation to have because then the sales team has what they need like you have to think about motivations right what is a sales team's motivation it's commissions and so what do you as product manager need to do to ensure that they can get their commission? That, that's what you're trying to do. You're not, the sales team motivation is not to ask you to build a thing. Sales team motivation is to get their commission. So you just have to show them how they can do that. And I think that's really what it comes down to, right? It's like, as a product manager, you have to understand motivations. Why does somebody want that thing? What are they looking to do? What are they trying to accomplish? Um, and then how do you help them to accomplish that? Whether you're building a product or whether you can suggest other things or, you know, whether you, and, and maybe part of it is that you, you change the roadmap. It could be that. Um, but in terms of who resolves a potential conflict, uh, like, I don't think you have an external party that comes in to try and figure out like, oh, okay, like, I'm going to tell you what to do. Like, you, you can't do that because that's the purpose of product, right? If product and sales have to be able to work together. If you're, if you're in, an, in a company or an industry that requires a sales team to be successful, then you have to find a way to work with them together. You can't expect somebody else to come in and resolve that conflict. Speaking of not expecting someone else to come in and resolve that, you know, one, one of the things that can be really difficult for people uh, is finding out what, they, what they're really passionate about and, and how they can sort of pursue those, those careers as well. So, Final question before we wrap up the interview is submitted from Sophie Chu, who wants to know, how did you find your passion and what advice would you have to, to young entrepreneurs or, or just young people in general? Yeah, um, I mean, it's funny, like I think Steve Jobs too, right? Like said it, like, I mean, it's like, you don't necessarily know at that moment what, that you did that thing, but I think for me, and like, this is just like a, a, a life thing, right? Where it's like the only decisions that you regret are the ones that you didn't take. And most decisions are not irreversible. And so I think the key is like, in terms of trying to figure out what you want to do, what drives you, what keeps you going, it is about, it's about exploring. It's about trying a bunch of different things and figuring out what, what made you happy and what didn't. And, and I do think also like people talk a lot about passion and passion is obviously important you have to have passion for what you do but there's also like with pretty much most things you try like you're not going to be like thrilled and happy about it every moment of every day there's going to be some really rough 
Patrick's where you just have to get through it. Like, and I actually think that like grit is a little bit more to it than anything else. Yes, you, you do need passion, but you also just have to like, there are moments even like when I'm working on different where I'm like, why am I doing this? This is so hard. I do I really want to keep doing this. And I just have to like really push myself through those moments sometimes because it's not, it's not easy. It's not simple. It's like a, a constant roller coaster and hopefully with like, you know, a positive trending slope, but like, it's not, it's not clean. It's not clear. Um, and so I think it's really, it's about trying a lot of different things. It's about working through some of the hard days. And, and I think that it's also about really being introspective and asking yourself the question, like if you're doing something and you constantly um, resent it, that's probably a bad sign. Um, and like there's, you know, and it's, sometimes you just need to take a week off and say like, all right, I just need a break right now and then figure out if you can come back and be recharged about it. Um, other times you can take the week off and then when you come back at the end of the week, you're just like, I just really don't wanna do this. I really just wanna go back to my vacation. That's when I think you know, like, hey, this isn't working. I need to find something else, I need to find something new. Great advice. And on that note, Mina, once again, thank you for, for coming on the show and thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, before we sign off, just a quick note from me. Uh, so this is part of a weekly series where we go live uh, live every week. Sorry, let me put that back onto full screen. We go live every week, every Tuesday at 8am, uh, I go live with uh, a new guest. And next week we have Fred Chabesto, who is the co-founder of finder.com, a global financial comparison website. Uh, they have over 10 million visitors each month. Uh, I um, have a staff of over 400 people and are currently operating in over 80 countries. So we'll be diving into the founder.com story, uh, their growth and expansion strategies, and uh, much, much more. So I hope you can join us next week. But once again, Mina, thank you so much for coming onto the show this morning and for sharing your experience and insights. And thank you all for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Thanks, Robert. Thanks so much for having me. And um, we are hiring, so please check out our website, different.com.au slash careers. <laughs> I'll add that into the show notes as well. Mina, thank you once again. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to episode 116 of the Startup Playbook podcast. As always, full show notes from this interview will be available at startupplaybook.co. I'll be back at 8 a.m. next Tuesday, the 23rd of June, with another live episode. And my guest for episode 117 is Fred Shabesta, the co-founder of Finder.com. Finder is a global personal financial comparison website that attracts over 10 million visitors each month, has grown to over 400 staff across six offices, and can be found in over 80 countries. I'm really looking forward to this interview and hope that you can join us. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next week.